Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, World Migratory Birthday Celebration events. And this is our first webinar for the World Migratory Birthday. Um, the title is Join the Quest of Lake Flight Challenge. And I'm Vivian Fu, Communication Officer of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. Um, this webinar is jointly organized with the um, Oriental Bird Club and support with support from BirdLife International and Spoonbill Sandpaper Task Force. Before we get started officially, I would like to go over a few notices uh, with you for participating in, the, uh, in today's events. Uh, first of all, um, during the webinar, it will be helpful if you can mute your mic so that it won't disturb the speakers. Second, um, please type your question to the speakers in the chat box. Um, you can find the speech bubble icon uh, at the bottom of the Zoom app. So you can leave your message um, there. And lastly, uh, we are live streaming this webinar on the EAFP Facebook page. So please feel free to share it on the Facebook post um, with the others. And next slide, please. This is today's rundown. And yeah, first of all, uh, we are going to have um, a welcoming speech from uh, our chief executive, um, Mr. Doug Watkins. And after that, we will have, uh, we will invite Dr. Lee Kisa from uh, Korean Water Birds Network and then Professor uh, Marcel Klassen from Deakins University to share with us about how bird watchers and general public can contribute to scientific research on uh, migratory water birds. We are also happy to have um, three moderators today. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have um, a next slide. <laughs> yes, next slide, please. And we have three moderators, um, Paul Inser Kao, um, Dr. Deng Li Yong, and Mr. Siam Chowdhury, uh, um, all of them with the hats from the Oriental Bird Club to um, support this webinar. So uh, without further ado, I would like to share the pre-recorded welcoming speech from our chief executive, Mr. Doug Watkins, to mark the opening of this uh, webinar. Happy World Migratory Bird Day. I'm Doug Watkins, the Chief Executive of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. Welcome to the October events to celebrate and express our appreciation for birds and nature. Together with the Convention on Migratory Species and joining the other flyways, the African Eurasian Waterbird Agreement and Environment for the Americas. World Migratory Bird Day is a global campaign to raise awareness, appreciation and love for migratory birds and to take action to conserve them. Although we still have travel restrictions due to COVID, we've seen in past events that there are innovative activities to make the best to reach out to the general public. For example, the World Migratory Bird Day virtual choir song, the online trivia, writing and drawing competitions and art exhibitions. This year, we are continuing to adapt to the new normal, but it won't stop us from working with our 39 partners of EAFP to promote and conserve migratory water birds and wetlands. COVID will not stop the birds from migrating and they are still facing threats such as habitat loss and degradation, urbanization, pollution, illegal hunting and invasive species. We are also continuing in the same vein to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day 2021 through online events and activities which you can also be part of. For the October events, the EAFP Secretariat and other EAFP collaborators are bringing you a series of online events including webinars, a puppet show for people of all ages and the global social media campaign to sing and dance like a bird. At this year's World Migratory Bird Day theme, Sing, Fly, Soar Like a Bird, says, as birds continue to sing, fly and soar along our flyways, they continue to remind us of our connection to the planet, the environment, wildlife and each other. We hope you will enjoy World Migratory Bird Day and join us to raise voices for migratory bird conservation. Thank you. So, um 
Um, thank you, Doc. And uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Paul Insurkow to uh, moderate the section. Um, Paul is the chair of the Conservation Committee of Oriental Bird Club. And Paul, over to you. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much, Vivian. And um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, as Vivian said, I'm chair of the Conservation Committee of the Oriental Bird Club. And as a club, we promote an interest in and an appreciation, appreciation for birds and their conservation uh, in Asia. We've got members throughout the world, but we particularly encourage members coming from the Asia region, of course. Um, members receive two publications, our annual bulletin called, um, a biannual bulletin called Birding Asia, and the Journal of Asian Ornithology, which some of you may know previously as uh, Forktail. Um, but the Oriental Bird Club also supports projects um, that advance knowledge and understanding of Asian birds and their conservation. And recently we established a migratory shorebird group, um, which includes myself and Vivian and Ding Li and, and Siam, who are moderating um, this webinar. And that, that uh, shorebird group helps give us focus to support um, more important shorebird conservation work in the region and hence this um, partnership with EAFP for this, this webinar. So we know there are some really serious challenges that shorebirds face on their annual migration in this region, and we need to have good science and good understanding of their migratory patterns to support their conservation and protection. So as you've heard, we've got a couple of great presenters um, coming up from Dr. Marcel Klassen and Dr. Lee Kisup. And we're going to learn more about bird migration and most importantly, also how you can participate as well. And uh, after these presentations, um, Dr. Yong Ding Lee will be telling us about a joint campaign um, for taking photos of tag birds and sending them through what we're calling hashtag leg flag challenge. So as you heard, put any questions or comments in the, the Zoom chat and we'll try to answer as many as we can during the presentations. And at the end of the two uh, presentations, we'll have a, a short Q&A session, depending on how much time is available. So first, um, Dr. Lee ki -Sup. He's the director of the Korean Waterbirds Network and the chair of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Blackface Spoonbill Working Group. And for me, it's a real inspiration to have seen how this bird has recovered over the, over the last couple of decades. And it really gives us hope for the future of other water birds uh, on the flyway, which are in quite dire straits. So Dr. Lee ki will be telling us about recent studies on, on migration of uh, black-faced spoonbill and how tracking the bird's movement informs us on their, their habitat use. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, it's nice, nice to meet all of you. Uh, I'm happy to uh, speak in, uh, in this webinar. Uh, I have studied uh, flappy spoons for 20 years, especially uh, on breeding site in Korea. As you know, in early 1990s, only 300 birds remained, but now the population have been increased uh, up to 5,000 birds. It's very good. Uh, and uh, it can be some many people's uh, efforts to conserve these spaces. And among them, uh, many citizens uh, try to uh, conserve that, uh, space, these spaces and uh, gave the record of color bands. So, uh, and this uh, can be uh, the good uh, for black smooth conservation in future. Okay. Uh, as you know, the recite uh, uh, information can give uh, many 
uh, information about the movement uh, and habitat use of black bass spoonbills. Now for this, uh, citizens can help very much. Uh, and the citizens can be interested by seeing uh, the color bands. Uh, if they see that, they will know, they, they, want, they want to know where it is from. And uh, if they knew that, uh, the market board can uh, stimulate uh, the peoples uh, to watch again the project spoonbills so we can get more data about that. But we have some challenges for that. Uh, citizens should uh, report the market board. Uh, but in many cases, uh, they just see and they don't know how can they report. So they don't report well. Uh, and another, uh, it should be, uh, they have to, uh, it's, it, it have to be easy to report and uh, it's easy to input the recite data. For that, we need some uh, homepage just like that. And uh, they wish to know uh, if they see the birds, the color bands, uh, they want to know the life history uh, of them. Uh, but uh, sometimes they also have uh, difficulties to identify the color bands and the number uh, because of the long distance or sometimes they can identify uh, long. Uh, but as you know, uh, you can see the pictures. Uh, if someone uh, saw the color bands of like Pumbis, and if he saw and he read the letter uh, S90 and color band G, blue, uh, green, blue, white. And in the end, after, after then, uh, if he, uh, uh, he know they, they uh, couldn't know the information all about uh, that, uh, that will be uh, good for um, for them and the uh, citizens can give more data. The reporting method of uh, recite of color bands uh, can be several uh, methods. Uh, one can be uh, reporting to web pages. Uh, we have very wonderful web pages uh, for black bass reporting. Uh, but in that case, we need some time. Uh, you have to uh, uh, attach, uh, you have to be low on the web page and uh, you have to input some uh, information. Uh, and another uh, method can be easy uh, using uh, uh, social network systems. Um, uh, it's quick, but uh, in that case, uh, ju uh, just limited people can be involved because of uh, uh, just like uh, language problems. Uh, as you know, in ASEAN, I have uh, many kinds of languages, so uh, it's a uh, little difficult to share uh, SNS uh, all together. And uh, if you see so the uh, color bands, you can also send the emails and you can get the replies, but it can be a little slow. And uh, you will have a question. Uh, and uh, in the case, uh, you want to know where is born and where is come from, how old is it, how about the history. Uh, for that, we have to say uh, answers, uh, maybe from web page or uh, some emails or other methods. And then uh, this can stimulate more people to join for watching Black Bass Pumbis. And many report, more report uh, about a tagged one can give much more information uh, for the um, movements and uh, it can contribute to conserve Black Bass Pumbis. Uh, this is the color bands for Black Bass Pumbis. Korea use red color bands and uh, also uh, not so many uh, color bands from China, but, but China also have red color bands. Taiwan use blue and Hong Kong use green. Japan use yellow. Russia use white color band. And they have the letter and so, uh, this is a uh, um, main color bands. And, and uh, another uh, 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 color bands is assistant color bands. We usually attach two or three color bands 
Uh, that means some serial number you know, from one to 100 uh, uh, numbers. Uh, this is uh, the home page of uh, you know, Blackface Spoonbill uh, Conservation Network. Uh, this was made by Taiwanese. Uh, he uh, contributed very well. So thanks to him, uh, we could get a very good web pages just like this. If you can contact, uh, you can see uh, in uh, home page, uh, total, we attach 990 bus. Uh, that's all from Korea and other uh, Taiwan or Hong Kong and other uh, countries. Uh, and the, the recite, uh, you can see the 656 bus and a record is uh, uh, many. So uh, this uh, from here, you can uh, easily uh, get the information about the color band, where is it, and uh, when it was attached. And if you see the maps, and uh, this is a recent distribution of uh, blackface spoonbills. So some uh, is in South Korea, and some in China, some in Taiwan. So uh, you can see uh, the uh, link numbers, and where was it, if you click uh, the site locations, you can get more detailed information. And also uh, there is a list of uh, uh, color bands. So if you click the list, uh, you can see all the list of color bands and you can get the information when it was attached and from where. Uh, and uh, uh, if you click uh, the number uh, and you can get the migration tracks. Uh, just like this, if you click uh, E37, you can see this is a male and this is uh, have a nickname, Taxihiro, and uh, carrying uh, transmitters. And this is all recited record. So you can get uh, many information from this. And where is the wintering place? Uh, Taiwan is the wintering place. And where is the breeding site? You can see the, uh, this is Incheon. Uh, so you can get many in, uh, interesting uh, histories of Blackface Spoonbill. Uh, so many people can easily uh, contact and get the information. And also we try to give some uh, color band list just like this. Uh, if you go outside, uh, you will be computed so many color bands on there. So if you see some uh, number, it will be no problems, but sometimes you have to read the letter, uh, K or Y or W. Uh, and if, if you see the color and the uh, where, which, uh, uh, position, right leg or left leg, uh, after then you can uh, distinguish it, the exact, uh, the color bands. And then if you can report to the web page, uh, it'll be good uh, for ours. And uh, we, uh, this is Koreans, but uh, we have uh, some social um, network just like this. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Kakao talk. Uh, Korean used uh, a lot of this. And this, uh, if you wish to contact with this, uh, you can get uh, many informations and you can communicate together. Uh, this is very instant, quick. So if so in the field, you can just uh, take a picture uh, with a smartphone and then uh, you can get the information which is which. Uh, and uh, we, we also uh, can uh, uh, talk together. So this is exciting. Uh, we have about 100 members in Korea. But uh, the problem is uh, we cannot uh, join to, uh, with other foreigners. And this is uh, GPS tracking data uh, in uh, 2020s. Uh, we, uh, I try to attach the color bands in every year uh, for 15 years. Um, and uh, uh, and that after then we can know uh, the information where they go, but 
it is not enough. So we also attach transmitters, uh, some of them. So I share the information of the tracking uh, route of them. So you can see uh, where they go and when they go. Uh, and this can stimulate uh, the peoples to see uh, the color bands. Uh, This is some case of them, uh, why 71 uh, was born in Incheon uh, last year. And this was seen by peoples. And uh, you can see uh, uh, why 71 uh, trying to get a food from uh, parents. And uh, at, at, after then, uh, he tried to uh, find food in dependent tree. Uh, and then it moved to North Korea and then China to Taiwan. So Taiwan, from Taiwan, uh, some uh, people could see this and uh, send the uh, information about uh, this. So uh, we can uh, know very well about uh, these uh, migrations together. And this is another case to migration to Japan. Uh, this is a two uh, tracking bus, Y33 and Y67. Uh, we realized it uh, didn't go direct to Japan. It uh, tried to find some route, sometimes go outside and come back. And uh, so it finally uh, could uh, arrive uh, on wintering site, but uh, before arrived on wintering site, uh, we could know uh, it uh, was tried to do find a good place. Uh, this is juvenile, the first migration. So we could know uh, this is uh, uh, a good cases for uh, that. Uh, and uh, when uh, it has migrated, I share the information where it is now. So uh, this, when it arrived on uh, August 25th at such chance, I asked to, I, I announced uh, to the peoples on local uh, place uh, and the local people found it and uh, share the photo of this. And he was so delighted to find this. And then it moved to Japan to Yasuchiro. And from uh, I also sent the email to them and they could find Y67. Uh, and then it moved to Osaka and uh, Ansan. Uh, uh, Kiso State is, win uh, is uh, the wintering place of this uh, Y33. Uh, just like this, uh, if uh, I can give some information about tracking's uh, results, uh, many people like that. Uh, and uh, uh, after then, we could get uh, uh, more data about color bands. And the recite information can give many uh, uh, information about uh, black face bomb uh, This is the result in 2002. Uh, the ratio of recite uh, rate was uh, about uh, 40%. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, we uh, attached 448 uh, color bands from Korea to Jubilees for uh, 15 years. And then uh, among them, 182 bars were recited. It's very good numbers. Uh, uh, the black face movie is not so many. Uh, so, uh, if, and many people like to see uh, this uh, black face movie. So, we could get many recite records just like this. And we could know uh, about 10 year old bird uh, was found, 30% uh, were found. Uh, this means maybe 70% uh, can be died. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was very good result. And for one year old was 50% uh, were found. Uh, some of them can be missed, some, uh, uh, but uh, we uh, can calculate 
the annual survival ratio uh, would be about 80 percent. Uh, of course, uh, it's higher on adults and lower on young. Uh, but uh, from this result, we can know uh, how they can do very well or not. Uh, and uh, uh, another case is we we uh, could find that the oldest bird was uh, uh, 2006. Uh, this means 16 years old, and it's still breeding in every year in Incheon. So uh, I started uh, attaching the Calaban uh, before 15 years. So we still don't know how uh, how many live, uh, but. Uh, with this data, we can uh, get more details about uh, blackface pumice and uh, we can uh, conserve the cons uh, habitats for futures. Uh, so if many peoples can enjoy together uh, for uh, the record, it will be very good for uh, conservation of blackface pumice. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Lee Kisup. Um, it's a very interesting presentation, and see there are many opportunities for um, the people to get involved and, and submit their sightings on a blackface spoonbill, which is one of the really charismatic bird species of the flyway. Uh, I wonder, Dr. Lee, if you could put the, the web address uh, in the chat bar um, for people to be able to access that information after the webinar. Um, so, so thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, now we're going to move on to um, Dr. Um, uh, Professor Marcel Klaassen. He is the director of the Centre for Integrative Ecology at Deakin University in Australia, which is at the very southern end of the flyway. And Professor Klaassen will be introducing a new portal called Birdmark, uh, which has been designed to report re-sightings of colour marked birds in the East Asian Australasian flyway. And he'll be informing us uh, how we can get involved in putting our records and in doing so helping with conservation research. So uh, I'll pass over to you, Marcel. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you all for uh for having me and allowing me to talk uh, about shorebirds and lag flags and, and notably how I think that uh, those lag flags can facilitate connecting us all along the flyway and uh, enthuse us to look at these uh, marvelous creatures and also, and importantly, to facilitate their conservation because they, they really need it. You know, we all like coastal areas, we all like uh, our shorelines. Uh, so there, there are many people that shorebirds need to share their habitat with and increasingly so. So they are not, um, so they're, they're, they are in difficult times. Let, let's put it this way. Um, okay, um, now if, try to go to the next slide yeah now nah. so uh, if uh, you haven't already been um, uh, enthused by Kisub Lee that uh, it is it is it's great to to look at lag flags and uh, and report this to to websites um, then maybe I can I can help you with with shorebirds but also of course importantly the the world of shorebirds is a little bit bigger than that of black-faced spoonbill. So if you are not blessed with having black-faced spoonbill in, in your uh, vicinity, then maybe shorebirds, they, um, they are a nice alternative. So this, is, this picture here is uh, showing you the uh, East Asian Australasian flyway. And um, across um, many sites along this flyway, there are researchers and, and uh, um, citizen science groups that are catching shorebirds and putting lag flags on them. There, I put here with stars some, some major sites where a lot of, of banding of birds is going on, uh, like in uh, Yalu, Yalu Jung and then uh, in Northwest Australia and Roebuck Bay and also in 80 Mile Beach and, uh, and here in the Melbourne area from where I'm 
talking to you now and also New Zealand and Miranda, that's another site. But there are, there are really many. There are actually, there are about 120 different banding schemes of shorebirds, of migratory shorebirds along this flyway. So that, that's really a lot. And about half of them, they put flags on them that are engraved and allow to identify the individual birds. Um, okay, um, so what, what, do the, what can you do with those flags? Well, one thing is that it connects us with, with those birds because we can now identify individual birds and, and these shorebirds, they are very sight faithful. So you may well see that bird of which you saw a lag flag one year and then it flies off, it goes to the breeding grounds in the, in, for instance, in the high Arctic. And then it, um, it comes back again to a staging site or, a, um, or uh, the non-breeding site um, the next year and you can see it again. So it connects us with the birds, but it also connects us with other people and other sites on the globe where that same bird might be seen. Now, aside from enthusing us and connecting us with, with these birds, it also is very important in doing research on the conservation of these, these birds. So for one thing, it, it learns us where do birds go and when do they go and how they rely on a change of different sites. So uh, the, the birds that we see here in the Melbourne area, they, they may show up a little later in Northwest Australia and a late, little bit later still in Indonesia and then well, along the whole East Asian coast. So it allows you to, so th these, these birds, they hop from one area to the next. Uh, so they, and, and all those sites that they use, they are like a chain. And, what we want to know, what are the weakest links? Because if there's a weak link in that, so a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So identifying the quality of those chains is really important. So identifying those weak links. And then another thing is that it tells us about the population dynamics, about the survival of these and the survival rate. And therewith also how these populations are doing. Okay, um, and then, so uh, the world is changing and that means that um, um, the, the, the challenges that the shorebirds are facing, they change all the time. And one of the important thing is then to keep track of how birds are coping with those changes. So uh, we need to monitor them. And these lag flags, they allow us to monitor how they are, how they are coping with the, the changing world around them. Okay, so what is a lag flag? Well, you've seen already a couple of, of uh, pictures. Now, this is a so-called engraved lag flag. So it is a, a, a lag flag with an inscription and that allows you to identify this bird. So this bird, you know exactly which individual it is. Now, there are also plain lag flags. You see an example here that is a bird with an orange flag. And that means, so this is a curlew sandpiper, and it, that means it is from Victoria here in Southeast Australia. And this is another, this is a red knot with an, an again, an engraved lag flag. And this one has a yellow flag, and we know that it is from uh, Northwest Australia. Now, there are lots of different schemes out there. I told you already, there are about 120 schemes. And so you've got birds with just one plain lag flag and birds with multiple plain lag flags. You've got birds with an engraved lag flag. So you see that here is number, I think it's number 34 with an, a plain lag flag, another combination. Um, and then there are birds which have uh, one lag flag with a series of color bands. So one flag with four color bands. Um, so there are lots of different schemes. Now to stick with, with this one, this particular combination. So here you've got 
the schedule, it's, uh, it's one flag and the position of that flag, where it's on the left leg and above the, the knee um, or under the lead, that, that determines which individual we are dealing with here. And also the colors of the bands. And this is something, so the one, one flag with four color bands, that's here in the Southern hemisphere from where I'm talking to you. So in Northwest Australia, it is used on, on a number of species and then it, it has a yellow flag with a series of color bands. And then in New Zealand uh, has white flags and then also with four color bands. But again, this is for few species only. So like for instance, here the bar-tailed godwit, um, red knot, gray knot, those are the species. Now also in, in the Northern hemisphere, so in yellow young, it's used, but then only on bar-tailed godwits. Okay, and then when it is only flags, so no uh, rings, then there are a lot of different schemes. Now, these are, this picture here is just showcasing the most important ones. So, but lots of combinations of flag colors, and, and in some cases, they can be engraved, in others, they are just plain. But there's a lot of variety, and each combination identifies a certain area where this bird was then being banded. Okay, now this is how we would like to, to see a bird with, uh, in this case, engraved lag flag. So this is uh, Ada. And um, so this, this sandling was banded in South Australia. And that's also what you can see by the band because orange on the top, yellow below, that means in South Australia, it's being banded. And this individual was banded on the 25th of April in 2015 in Brown Bay. And it was already two, more than two years old. So it was an, an adult. And um, it was seen again in, uh, in China on the 8th of May, 2018. And I believe that's when this, this picture was made. Um, so this is, this is how you how you would ideally see them with, with for instance, a, a, a telescope or with a, a, a camera with, with a good lens on it. Um, but please make sure that you, that you don't stress and harass birds, right? So don't go too close. You shouldn't. But this, this is ideal situation. And most of the times you'll, you'll see them like this. And of course, there's no chance you can see the engraved lag flags um, uh, when, when they are flying like this. But when they settle, and you're a patient, then you might be able to take a picture like this. Now, this is a picture taken in, in Northwest Australia, Roebuck Bay. And you see, I hope at least you see that. So there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of yellow here because they, they put in Northwest Australia, they put yellow flags on, on birds. Now, these ones are plain flags here. And this is this one you can't read all that well. It's something with an N. And this one is uh, the, a flag with uh, four color bands, but it doesn't show all color bands, so you can't read it. But we've got a, on this picture a couple of individuals where we can uh, read it. So for instance, we've got here um, two greater sand pluffers, CDK and LCH. And uh, this, is, this is their data. So for the one at the, on the bottom, LCH, it was banded when it was uh, still a juvenile, so one year old, and it was banded in 2013. The last time it was seen, after it had been seen as many as 31 times, um, but only it, it was only seen in Northwest Australia. Uh, so in 2017, when it was five years old, that was the last time it was seen. And, and CDK was last seen in 2016, eight years old. But there are more birds here we've got here, two curlew sandpipers standing nicely close together. And you see here, they were, they, well, well, let's focus on BDE. That's this bird here. It was seen as many as 34 times. And I think many of those times it was seen by Chris Hessel. And I believe he's also in the audience today. And then um, uh, we've got uh, one more bird here. This is uh, a ruddy turnstown. It's ES. It was banded when it was two years old, exactly. And in 2013, and it's still around. I saw yesterday, I looked it up. And um, 
So it has seen it has been seen now 68 times, and in 2021 uh, March it was seen for the last time. So it is in the meantime it's already 10 years old, and it's still going strong. Okay, so now if you have these kinds of observations, you would of course like to let the world know that you saw them because you would like to contribute to um, uh, to. to the research and, and indeed also connecting with others along the flyway. And uh, for that, uh, well, we've, we've got already a database for many, many years, but it's only in the beginning of this year that uh, we brought a portal online to, um, to start managing this a little bit better. Because in the meantime, uh, we've got more than half a million resightings of shorebirds. So, the Australasian Waiter Study Group starting uh, making a database already many years ago. And to be very exact, it is now 548,000 records that are in there. And uh, it was the AWSG uh, together with the Victorian Waiter Study Group and Deakin University that, that made this portal. Now let, let's go to this portal. So we go to the internet now. I hope you can still see my, my screen. Um, so, um, yeah, th so, so we are now on, on the internet. This is, this is the, the Birdmark portal. It still has a horrible, horribly long address. We are in the process of making it much easier, making birdmark.net, but that will, um, that, yeah, that, that is a bit of process. Uh, we are working on it. I will sh give you this link in the chat box later at the end of my talk. Uh, so, but this is the portal in it, and this is the, the import form. So we are now in the first step here. So uh, aside from giving you some links to how do you actually note um, a, um, a lag flag and given all these different combinations, well, the British Trust for Ornithology made a really nice way of, of doing that. So this is, there's a link to show you uh, to the, to the site of the British Trust of Ornithology. Then there are a few sites that give you information about uh, what, what flag combinations are out there and also some handy tips on reading lag flags. Okay, then this is here where you can, you can put your name. So I can put my own name here. So you fill it out and the date. And, and before, for instance, you say, well, I've seen a, a ruddy turnstone today, then you can upload a picture of, of the bird if you've got um, a nice picture, but, but also just to verify that you have seen that animal. It's not needed, but you can upload a picture if you like, and then you can fill in uh, from where you have. So you can zoom in uh, and out in this map. So it allows you to any place, but let's uh, say that uh, I, this morning I was in King Island and I saw that ruddy turnstone. There are ruddy turnstones in King Island at the moment. I saw it here, so it gives you a position. You can still change the position there. And then you have to fill out what, what you saw. Now, if you say, oh, I've got a, an orange flag. And, uh, and then if a bird from there typically has an orange flag on the top and uh, a blue flag at the bottom, and then the top flag is engraved, and then you say, uh, well, it's a minor, you, you put there, okay, that was bird XPV. And this is, this is for real, that bird exists. And it might well be around there at the moment. Uh, so this is one of our major study sites where we, where we look a lot at these birds. Okay, and then, uh, so you've filled it all out. There's then the, the BTO code is written automatically. Now you've clicked it in and then you, add it to your holding table. And there you can see, okay, this is the data that I'm, and then you can, so you can read it and verify it. You can still change it. So you can change, so you say, oh no, that wasn't today. That was, that was yesterday exactly, actually. So you can do that and you can make notes here if you like. And then when you want to submit it, you click this one. But of course I don't do this because uh, this is just a fake entry. Uh, but this is how you can submit your data. Now, if you are a, 
if you're really into this and you read many, many flags, where you can also, and then this becomes a little bit cumbersome. So if you have many, so there is a manual importing facility, that's this. So you can download a template in Excel and type it all in uh, without making use of this interactive import form. Okay, then I want to show you um, uh, the, the, so the, these parts uh, are for uh, data that we want to share with you. So one thing that you can do is you can look at submitted pictures. So this is not only containing the pictures that you submitted, but also that all other people may have submitted. So you have a map here and you can look at, let me see if there's, I believe there are some nice pictures here made in Darwin recently. So let's, uh, let's look at this. So, well, yeah, well, we can take that. So what I, if I want to, uh, I make it bigger, I right click, open it in a new tab. So we're going to that tab. So this is, okay. So this was a, a bird with a black flag over yellow. And uh, now let's look if there are some other nice birds there. This one, it's also a big group. I think there, there were some stunning pictures. Let's look at these, that one. Yes, look at that. Um, look at that, that's uh, some, a few beautiful birds there. Um, so you can look at, um, on that form, you can look at other birds and also see all kinds of details on the birds that, that have a picture associated with them. And then I want to show you one other thing there. So uh, tap on the where do birds go. There you can, for all the species that have lag flags, you can um study all the data that have been collected on them already so this is uh, i just shown you now for the curlew sandpiper um so this is uh, just showing you where they have all been seen so these are a huge numbers of um uh, observations that have been made these are some of the, the schemes that, uh, so you can click a specific scheme. So for instance, you can say, oh, let's, let's look for uh, curlew sandpipers that have been uh, banded here in, in South Australia. Now let's, let's look at, so now we are only doing, where, where can we find them in January? Um, so I'll zoom in a little bit. Yeah, so where can we find them in January? And then let's, let's go to their migration. So February, a little bit further. So, they, so of course, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere summer, they're down here, but then in March, April, they start to make their way north. And you see that. So now, so in April, the first are being seen in, uh, in China and um, elsewhere on the, uh, in Korea. And then they go into Mongolia in July. And uh, well, then you, you, you don't see them anymore. Well, there, there should be at some, ah, yeah, when did that one pop up there on the breeding ground? Yeah, so that was already in June, July, in July, when it, it started coming up there. So anyways, for all the species uh, that have lag flags, you can, you can play with this site. And, and see where they go. And there, here, there, down here, there are tables with some more data on it. Anyways, that's a, that's a fun side to just get an impression of uh, where the animals go and where they are being seen. And of course, you can zoom in into, into these maps and look in great detail where there are actually also great sites where there's a, a, a great chance for you to see um, some, some birds. So you see here in, in Hong Kong, there's a major hotspot there. Um, okay. Now, of 
course, there are also uh, there's a help guide for this. So I made a couple of videos that show you how to submit an engraved flag, uh, how to submit a flag with four color bands, um, and and different ways, different also tricks how to how to make it easy for you. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, but now back to the the import form. If you have filled out this and you have submitted it, what do you get back? What do you get in return? And um, I will um, I will show an example of uh, a submission that was made by Lin Chu um, about a month ago. Uh, Lin Chu also included this picture of a of a great knot, and you see there three Y set. And uh, if we click on that picture now, we get to the report that Lin Xu then received via email. Now these reports, they are sent out uh, every week. So you may have to wait a couple of days. We are in the process of automating this, uh, but we, we aren't quite there yet. But um, we hope that um, well, within a couple of months, you'll have the same day or the next day, you will get a report on your bird. Um, so, this is what uh, Lin Chu then, then got from us. So uh, that's a, a report in, in HTML format via email. It's just a little bit about the background of the, the whole project. Also telling you that I will, sorry, I'll make it a bit bigger, telling you that these observations will be shared with the people that actually banded the birds. So um, although it's all being stored at our birdmark database it is being shared with the people that banded um, the birds so here you see the the observation of Lin Chu uh, so three y set was seen in uh, in Shandong uh, in China and uh, on the 24th of August and uh, then you get a history of this great knot so this is for this specific individual I first show you here the table uh, from the moment it was uh, first caught. So that was in 2017 and where it was then all, all seen. Um, and then the last observation was by Lin Chu um, themselves. And um, yeah, so the, and this allows you then to zoom in. So where exactly was it then seen and, and caught in in Broome, and you see here that um, so it, it was seen on, on many places. I, I'm certain it is uh, nearly all observations by Chris Hassel, and many places uh, in Rubak Bay. And uh, then uh, let's zoom out again. Uh, so we've got some observations in, so this is, I. This is Lin Chu. Yeah, you see already. So there's a label there. It's a great knot. That's the, the band number it has. And then uh, seen on the 24th of August. And here you've got another observation of the same bird two years ago in July. So on its way to the breeding grounds uh, in, in Kamchatka. So um, yeah, and you can see in great detail where it has been. It was seen then. Okay, so this is the kind of feedback do you, that you get. So for each bird that you've seen, uh, when we were able to link a band number to it, you'll get a, a full report on uh, where it has been seen, including names of the, the people that uh, have been seen, provided those names are, are, are known. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's it. Um, so uh, thanks for listening. I hope I was able to uh, make you all enthusiastic about uh, going out and looking for uh, bands on, on shorebirds. And uh, again, uh, in that way, help um, assist the conservation of, of these birds and, our, and just our knowledge or satisfying our curiosity about where they go and how they fare. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Marcel. That was uh, really interesting, packed full of information there. And as you, you said, you were going to put the, um, the address uh, in the chat bar so people can uh, find out more and also delve a little bit deeper. I think the great thing about both of these, uh, what's been offered in both of these presentations is, you know, the chance for us all to be engaged in directly in conservation by, by uh, submitting our records. And also, you know, to have this, this sort of feedback, I think is great. It gives us a sense of um, what our contribution is, what, what our record is making in terms of a contribution to conservation. And on top of that, I think it's really nice how this um, connects people. So, um, you know, we all love birds, but you know, somebody in Australia realizes there's, there's somebody in, in Korea who also loves birds just as much as they do. Um, something that Marcel uh, highlighted was also the importance of protecting and a, a chain of sites across the flyway. So it's no good having the, the perfectly beautifully protected site in Australia or in Korea when everything in between, between is, is being uh, seriously degraded, hunting, loss of habitat, because birds are not going to come back to those beautifully protected sites if the other sites are not protected. So um, I understand we've got a lot of people on the, the, uh, in this webinar from across the flyway. We've all, always got to keep that in mind um, to, uh, you know, to, to keep pushing for protection of sites up and down the flyway. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, uh, but I just want to get a quick couple of questions to both of you. One is about uh, language support and broadening that um, sort of the outreach. So, Dr. Lee, you, you mentioned the social media is, is mainly through Kakao, which is predominantly a, a, a Korean um, social media platform. So. I wonder, maybe Dr. Lee first, if you're there, um, can you give us so your, your thoughts about plans for broadening the social media platform and, and the language uh, support for the Blackface Boombill um, uh, website? Uh, until now, I have no idea how can it do uh, with the social network or with foreigners, uh, but I'll try to find some method for that. But until now, I have no uh, method now. Hmm. Okay, well, this is all work in progress. And I wonder, you know, Marcella, you raised your eyebrows when, when I, <laughs> I brought that question up. I wonder if the thoughts about, uh, I know bird markets at a very early stage, and I see you've put up a slide already that's showing uh, bird marking in Chinese, which is great. I wonder if you could comment a little bit further on plans uh, for bird mark in terms of language support. Marcel? Yep, I'm, you can hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, uh, sorry, I will. Um, so now we've got um, yeah language. Well, it it is a one. It's a lot of work. So uh, I I understand uh, Kisubli uh, entirely that um, it's it's difficult. At the same time, I I love languages and it's it's beautiful that we all have our own language. Uh, but it's also nice that we many of us also now understand English uh, quite well, which is also not my first language. Uh, please un understand that too. Uh, so what we have chosen for in, with Birdmark is to first get it going with English. But as you see here on this slide, so we also have a couple of other languages there. And uh, if people want to volunteer to help with this effort, uh, so that, that will be fantastic. But uh, so we have started in, in making available a, a variety of languages uh, already, but it hasn't been implemented throughout. Uh, like I said, we, we started with this um, in uh, January this year, we, we launched it, so made it 
public. Uh, um, uh, but we, we definitely uh, acknowledge that there are many languages and, and uh, that we should further this uh, in, into the future. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Great. Thanks, Marcel. That looks, that's great. That's more than I expected at this early stage of a, a big project like that. Um, we're, we're, um, we've used up our hour, but if you could bear with us a few more minutes, um, I'd like to hand over to my colleague from BirdLife International, uh, Yong Ding Li. And um, I, I've got one one question from Dave. Sorry, before that, one question from David Lee. Um, if you could keep it short, um, please uh, turn on your microphone and uh, and ask. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to for the two presenter. Uh, fantastic. I just uh, wonder uh, for Marcel, uh, how we're we going to interpret uh, incorporate the EFB the flagging Facebook uh, uh, in the post there uh, in future uh, and with the bird mark in, in the same time. Uh, so do people need to, uh, okay, to me is uh, the Facebook provide a good platform for awareness, for discussion, for, for, for uh, so and verification of the record as well. So it would be a pity that uh, Facebook uh, will roll out, but again, how to not to duplicate the effort. So just, uh, just uh, uh, try to verify. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the, for the question, uh, David. Uh, that's, a, that's a really important one. Well, um, so in the past, um, we, we have been doing a lot via Facebook and, and via email, but yeah, when you've got so many reports coming in. So like I said, there are now more than half a million cases in the database. So it's just, and we are all volunteers, right? So uh, although I'm also a professional ornithologist, this is, this is my spare time. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is not for my work. Uh, and that also holds for many other people that are involved in this. There are some key players in, in making this all happen. But, but uh, there's a, a legion of volunteers involved, um, including all the observers. Now, um, so it, is, it, it would really be good if people wouldn't only put it on Facebook, but would also start using this. At the same time, for instance, people like uh, Catherine Luang is, uh, is, is trawling the internet, is taking a lot from Facebook and putting it on, on the website. So that's... That's uh, that's fantastic that Catherine is is doing that, but it um, look of course you would like to share your beautiful pictures with 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 other people and and use Facebook for that, but uh, yeah I hope that um, uh, that with this facility that we can attract people to also submit it there that that would be that would be good yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we we'll see how this eventually uh, certain arrangement can be made. That's great. Oh, oh, and and one more thing, uh, David. So, if people have um, special ideas about how can we make it uh, simpler and uh, also uh, more engaging, uh, the, our Birdmark website, then uh, I, I cannot say that we can then immediately implement it, not at all, but we are always keen to hear suggestions on, on how to make it uh, more fun uh, doing um, conservation work and engaging with the birds and with others along the flyway. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your question and thanks, Marcel. And on that point of more fun, I'm gonna hand over to Yongding Li uh, to tell us about another uh, EAFP OBC um, joint initiative, which is called hashtag leg flag challenge, which is closely related to this. Over to you, Ding Li. 
Thanks, thanks, Paul, uh, for the introduction. Um, and also thanks uh, to the uh, excellent presentations by Dr. Lee and Dr. Klaassen uh, in telling us why it is so important for us to report Lake Flex. Um, I don't think I'm going to go into the details because I think both uh, presentations have made it crystal clear to us, you know, uh, whether you are a bird watcher attending this event or whether you are a professional an ornithologist, um, there is incredible amount of uh, knowledge we can gain out of uh, birds with uh, leg flex on them. When we know where these birds are, um, we are able to use that information to figure out what are the, the, the wetlands that are important to them, which will help their presentation. So uh, coming from the EFP, uh, from the Oriental Bird Club and from BirdLife International, uh, we want uh, to encourage more people to look out for leg flex to contribute to initiatives like those that are led by Dr. Lee and Dr. Klaassen. And uh, this is the second year in a row that uh, we have the Lake Flag Challenge. What is the Lake Flag Challenge about? It's a really simple campaign, uh, but I, we think that it's, it's, it, it can have quite a bit of impact. Uh, it's a really simple campaign whereby we want bird watchers, we want ornithologists out there to go out whichever wetland that is near your house and look out for water birds. It could be a black face spoonbill, it could be a red shank, it could be a wimbrow, it could be a spoonbill sandpiper. Look out for these lake flags. Take a photograph of those uh, birds that you see and uh, hashtag it as uh, lake flag challenge when you post it on Facebook. Uh, there will be exciting prizes to be won. Uh, and as you can see on our little flyer here, uh, for those of you who are able to find the most number of birds, all right, with lake flags, most number of unique birds with lake flags, you may stand to win the uh, the uh, HBW All the Birds of the World volume, which covers pretty much all the birds of the world, you know, in pictures. So uh, this is a really cool initiative that uh, that has been ongoing. And uh, now is the time for you to go out and look out for these migratory birds because migratory shorebirds black face spoonbills uh, and other sorts of uh, seabirds, they are now quickly streaming into southern China and to Southeast Asia. So for those of you who are planning to go to the field in the next week or the next month, go out, look out for these birds and report them on Facebook and put the hashtag there, Lake Flag Challenge. You will stand to win exciting prizes. Uh, and on that note, I would like to pass the floor uh, back to my colleague, uh, Paul and Vivian, who will take us to the closing part of today's presentation. Thank, thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you, Ding Lee, and I encourage everybody who can to get involved. Um, I've just put in the, the chat the website of the Oriental Bird Club. Um, it's open to everybody for membership. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier on is we also accept donations. Um, we're an entirely voluntary run uh, organisation, so any money that comes to the uh, Oriental Bird Club uh, as a donation 100% of it goes towards conservation projects. And if you do go to the, the website and donate and you put shorebirds uh, or words to that effect, uh, they will come to, um, they will go to conservation of, of shorebirds in Asia, and particularly on the East Asian Australasian flyway. Um, well, I'd like to thank everybody for their participation and for, for hanging on a, a little bit longer. A couple of really, really good presentations. There's a lot to take in there. Um, you can, you'll be able to see this presentation, this this webinar again on YouTube. Uh, if you want to recap on on some of the things that uh, Dr. Lee and Marcel have uh, been telling us about, I encourage you to all get involved in one way or the other. There's lots of ways to get involved, no matter your level of experience. Um, one thing that we didn't really have time to go through is you don't have to be you don't have to have the greatest camera equipment um you know something with some showing some color leg flags even if they can't you can't see the engraved letters on the flags you know get those submit those um, photos to one of these platforms i'd like to thank everybody especially to the presenters um and uh, pass over to vivian to um to sign us out of this uh, this webinar. 
Thank you, um, Dr. Lee, uh, Professor Klassen, um, Paul, Deng Lee, naturally Siam as well for facilitating the webinar. And uh, one more uh, little note about this Lake Black Challenge, the EAFP um, 20. Uh, 22 calendar, we are going to select um, photos from the platforms uh, from the Lake Flag Challenge, a uh, hashtag Lake Flag Challenge um, post on the Facebook. Um, and also we will select um, submission on the bird mark platform, which uh, Professor Klassen introduced today. So yeah, hopefully maybe your uh, photos will be featured on the EAFP calendars next year. So please join us. And uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I wanted to promote more uh, about our coming events. So tomorrow we will have another World Migratory Birthday webinar, and it will be uh, presented by um, Philip Malakou um, on the about the the breeding sites of um, Norman Greenshank and other shorebirds in Russia. And we'll also share about new uh, recent findings of forest and curlew study in Indonesia. So tomorrow, 4.30 um, uh, Korea time, please join us on the webinar. And on the Saturday, which is the real day for World Migratory Birthday, it is a Saturday. Maybe you're with your family, with kids. So we are going to bring you a, a new puppet show, um, The Bird with Wings, um, produced by a New Zealand uh, production house called Bird Life Productions. Um, they are going to share um, a puppet show of a boy, is his adventure with the Bartel Godwit. So um, please join us and I think it will be really fun to and engaging with uh, people at all age. So please register um, all this uh, webinar, especially the, uh, the September uh, the Saturday uh, podcast show, we are not going to live stream it. So, and only have limited quota. So please register as soon as possible. And lastly, um, next slide, please. Please follow EAFP uh, on the social media and our website for more activities. Um, thank you very much for all your support and joining the uh, webinar today. So hope to see you tomorrow and on Saturday as well. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.